Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 21. A few thoughts here as we jump into the, the, the text this morning. Remember last week, verses 5 through 13, it was about the simplicity of the gospel, how accessible God is. You just call on Him, and He answers. This morning, as we look at uh, the final verses of chapter 10, a couple things here. Remember that the overall context is how the Apostle Paul is addressing why so many uh, Jewish religious men and women have rejected a Jewish Messiah one who came from the line of David, one who fulfilled all the prophecies of Isaiah and Zechariah, Micah and Amos and all of them. Why did they reject him? He's trying to address that problem, and he's saying, I, I don't have a new gospel. I have the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Here's why they're not accepting it. That's the context. The second thought is this. Notice as we go through the text the importance of the Hebrew Bible for the Apostle Paul, the importance of the Old Testament. Here that he's going to reference um, David and the Psalms, Moses from Deuteronomy 32, and there's going to be four quotes from Isaiah. That's why we have Isaiah in our call to worship and in our confession. A lot of Isaiah. And so here's the point of that, which is the Old Testament was vitally important for Paul as he understood the work of Christ. And the Old Testament is vitally important for you to understand the work of Christ. Christ fulfills everything from Genesis to Malachi. The final thought here, uh, more application thought, is As we look through the text, the main point I want you to think about is, how do I hear God's word? That's what he's addressing. How do we hear God's word? That's his main point uh, in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 21. So let's, let's go to God's word. Paul writes, But how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him in whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? And so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand First, Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation, and with a foolish nation I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to have ears to hear the gospel this morning. Help us to understand the text as the Apostle Paul wrote it so many centuries ago and help us to apply it in a way that points us to a crucified and risen Savior. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this morning as we get to the end of the summer, almost the end of the summer, and get into the fall, school is starting up for a lot of you going off to college, starting up a, a, a uh, a new fall semester with school for our, for our kids. And the fall is approaching, and, and we have a big election coming up. Local election, state election, national election. So that's always in the news. It's always election stuff. So-and-so is running for this office and that office. And becomes it kind of takes over the news in, in so many ways. And um, so many of our current events and the headlines are about what's happening and with different elections and different campaigns. And it reminded me of a story about a, a politician a century ago, the early 20th century, uh, he, was, he was a mayor up in the Northeast, Mayor Frank. Mayor Frank, again, 100 years ago, uh, kind of a violent guy. Kind of a violent guy, not a pacifist when it came to his political opponents. There was a time when uh, one of his political opponents came to the mayor's office, the, 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 the guy that he disagreed with, a guy named Michael Fagan. And so Mayor Frank and Michael Fagan are having a disagreement. It's getting volatile. And you know what Mayor Frank did? over the disagreement, he punched Michael Fagan right in the face and knocked him out in the mayor's office, just knocked him out cold. That's how he dealt with political opponents. He just took him out. Uh, that would never happen in Columbia, South Carolina, at the Capitol, or in Charleston. We don't do that down here. Not too much. We used to, I think, actually, but uh, not anymore. Mayor Frank was a violent guy. At another time, a guy came to him. The guy's name was um, Jeff Burkett. He was a longtime opponent of Mayor Frank, Jeff Burkett. And Mayor Frank 
not only when he took the job did, um, did he remove a lot of the police officers, but he removed a lot of the police officers and replaced them with some guys that were loyal to him on the police force. And so he had cops that did what he wanted. And so one of his political opponents was this guy named Jeff Burkett. And Mayor Frank had a lot of his cops just, quote unquote, rough him up from time to time, take care of him, keep him quiet a little bit. So one day in the mayor's office, Jeff Burkett, this opponent of Mayor Frank, comes to, to the mayor's office. He's got bandages on his head from the cops. And he goes, Frank, you, you got to tell your cops to lay easy, go easy on me and lay off. Like, you're, they're just being too aggressive. you, you got to stop. I'm, I'm hurting here. I've got all these bandages. Mayor Frank looked at him, started laughing, and said, oh, I can't do that. I can't pull the cops off of you like that. He goes, it's just so funny to see you with bandages all over your head. And he started laughing in his face. That's how Mayor Frank dealt with his political opponents. Violence, mockery, he went after people. I think of that because as we look at Romans 10, the people Paul is addressing are his opponents, the people that he does not agree with, the people that don't agree with him, the Jewish religious leaders who have rejected Christ, rejected the gospel, and ultimately rejected the apostle Paul. And think about the, the, the history of the apostle Paul. The apostle Paul, when he's writing Romans, has been an apostle, a church planter, a missionary, a pastor, a preacher, all those things for about two and a half decades. And he has a lot of political, religious enemies. And if you read one, or 2 Corinthians 11, you get a list of all the things that happened to Paul, many of those because of his political opponents. They slandered him, they lied about him, they mocked him, they beat him up, they whipped him, they tried to kill him for two and a half decades. Those are political opponents for the Apostle Paul. And as we look at Romans 10, how does he address them? He doesn't do what Mayor Frank did, which is like try to bring them in and just rough them up a little bit, beat them up. He's trying to present the truth to them to win them over so that his enemies become his allies, that his opponents become his brothers and sisters in Christ. For his opponents, Paul does not want retribution. For his opponents, he wants redemption. He wants them to know the gospel and believe it. It's really remarkable. If I, were, if I were the Apostle Paul and I was writing the people who tried to kill me for two and a half decades, I would not be that nice. I would be getting lawyers, going after them, let's take them out. The Apostle Paul is trying to win them over to the gospel. And so as we, as we look at our text this morning, remember where we left off last week in verse 13. Remember the context. The context was, for anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that was a reference to the Old Testament prophet Joel. Joel chapter 2, verse 32 Joel writes, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. And, and Gary taught on that from Acts chapter 2, that great sermon that, that Peter gives at Pentecost. He references Joel chapter 2. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's what we saw last week. And, and when, when the Apostle Paul said, anyone who calls on the Lord, he's using the word Lord there in Greek is that word kurios. You would have called Caesar your Lord, Curios. In the Old Testament, the, the, the Greek Old Testament called the Septuagint, that word is used 600 times to describe God the Father. He is Lord. He is Curios in the Greek Old Testament. Notice what Paul has done. The Apostle Paul has applied that term to Jesus Christ. That is remarkable. He's saying the one in the, in the Old Testament that you called God the Father, that you called the, the Holy One of Israel, to use Isaiah's language, that, that person who is God is, is also Jesus Christ. It is applied to him. There is God the Father and there is God the Son, Jesus Christ. He is applying a term of divinity to Christ. Christ is not just a good guy who had some good thoughts and then they beat him up and killed him. No, he's the Son of God. He is equal with God the Father. That's what that means that we saw last week. And that leads to what Paul says here in our text in, in verse 14 through 17. He begins with, Four rhetorical questions. And if you've been with us the last almost year studying through Romans, the Apostle Paul likes to use rhetorical questions. There's been dozens of them, it seems like. And here he has four rhetorical questions, and he's trying to use them to get to the problem. Why so many people have rejected Christ? So many Jewish people have rejected a Jewish Messiah. And he's using these rhetorical questions kind of in reverse order. He's going not from cause to effect to get to the problem. He's going from effect to cause. He's going in reverse order. It's almost as if he's counting backwards, going 10, 9, 8, 7. 
He's trying to get to the problem by going in reverse order. So let's, let's look at these questions very briefly, and then we'll apply them. The first question is, how are they to call on the one that they haven't believed in? That's the, that's the ultimate fact. If they can't, they can't call on him if they don't believe in him. So that leads to the second question, how can they believe if they've never heard? He's saying maybe they haven't heard the message. Maybe if they just heard, they would have believed the gospel. And I wonder, as, as I was studying the text this week, I wonder if the Apostle Paul in the back of his mind is thinking of kind of the irony there. If they only heard, they would have believed. I wonder if he's thinking of the problem in the Old Testament, which is that God continually sent prophets that they wouldn't listen to. Remember, he sent Elijah, for example. They didn't like Elijah. They tried to kill him, right? Remember when God sent Jeremiah? How'd that go over? They imprisoned him. They persecuted him. They threatened him. They beat him up. They didn't like Jeremiah. Think of, think of Amos, the prophet Amos. Amos comes in and, and prophesies and tells him, oh, you're, you're doing the wrong thing. You're rejecting God's word. You know what they tell him? They say, go home. Don't prophesy here anymore. So I wonder if the Apostle Paul is saying, yeah, if they only heard, they would have believed, but he's probably thinking through the Old Testament saying, a lot of times they heard and they didn't believe. A lot of times they heard God's word and rejected it. So that leads to the, the second, or the, rather the third question, rhetorical question that Paul gives us. He says, well, how can they hear without preaching? Maybe they need more pastors, more preachers, more apostles. Maybe if we just had more people out there preaching that they would hear and believe. And that leads to the final question, which is very, a very subversive question that Paul is using here. The fourth question here, he says, has God sent those preachers? And it's subversive in the sense of he's trying to get the person to say, are you blaming God for this? Are you saying that God hasn't done his job? If only God would have sent more Jeremiah's, they would have listened, right? If only God had sent more people like Amos, they would have listened. If there were only more Elijah's, they would have listened. He's getting them to acknowledge that that wouldn't have helped. The problem is not with God. The problem is not that God hasn't sent enough people. It's the problem that he has sent the people, and they've been rejected, persecuted, sometimes killed. It's not God's fault. And so Paul here in these four questions is going from effect to cause. He's trying to diagnose the problem, and he's saying God sent preachers. God has sent people. They have heard. So what's the problem? And the problem is this. Here's his first main point. It, the, the main problem is unbelief. A lack of believing in God's word. Hearing it, doubting it, questioning it, and ultimately rejecting it. That's the problem. It's a problem of unbelief. The problem isn't with God. The problem isn't with his messengers. It has nothing to do with God. The, the problem is sin. The sin of unbelief. Of hearing God's word and saying, yeah, I don't know. I'm not really sure about that. I think I might know a little bit better than God. I think my views are a little bit more informed than the God of the universe, which is very arrogant to think. The problem is not with God. The problem is with sin, the sin of unbelief, the sin of wanting to have life on our own terms rather than on God's terms, to create our own truth, our own reality, to live the way we want to apart from God as if we are a deity. That doesn't work. It never has worked. It never will work. The problem here in verses 14 through 17 is not with God. It's not with his messengers. It's with a hard, sinful heart. The prophet Ezekiel said a heart of stone. Stones don't feel anything. They don't respond to anything. They just sit there. A heart that rejects God's word. A heart that is dead to God. A heart that's enslaved to sin. And the only hope for a heart that is dead is if someone comes and resuscitates it and gives it life. And... The good news is you can't do it. God has to do it for you. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Dead stones don't turn into hearts that are alive to God. God's Holy Spirit creates dead stones that become a heart of flesh, a heart that's alive, beating for the gospel. God has to do that work. It's good news because if it was up to us, we would not be able to accomplish it. That's why it's good news. He's done it for us. And so to, to make his point even more clear, the Apostle Paul tells, takes us back to a, a story from the Old Testament. If you remember in the 6th century uh, before Christ, uh, the Babylonians came into Jerusalem, and they didn't come in with, with a, a peace treaty or a UN envoy for, for peace. They came in with swords. They came in with chariots. They came in with weapons of war. And that nice little wall around Jerusalem to protect them was demolished. That beautiful golden temple that Solomon had built and that they had celebrated in one kings, 
demolished it, razed it to the ground. The Babylonians were not into peace. They were into power, like most empires. And violence is a way to accomplish power and authority over others. Paul takes them back to that disaster, and he says, you remember, that happened in the 6th century, but about 150 years before that happened, there was this guy named Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied that the Babylonians were going to come in and do this, and he gave that warning. But Isaiah is not all bad news of warnings of destruction and and bad news, and it's all going to be terrible. Isaiah also gave good news, and that's what Paul uses here. He said, Isaiah did announce that there's a coming destruction, but he also said there's going to be a a relief from that. It's going to be over after a set period. God is going to redeem his people out of captivity. He's going to redeem his people. He's going to provide for them after that happens. That's what Isaiah 52 says. Isaiah 52 is, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings news of happiness, who publishes salvation. He's saying, how, how great is the news? How beautiful is the news that the captivity in Babylon is going to be over? You could also translate that word beautiful. It's beautiful news. You could also translate that as timely news. Because they've been told they're going to be facing destruction. It's timely news that that destruction is not permanent. God will come back and restore his people. It's great news. It's beautiful news. It's timely news. That's what Paul is referencing here. Who wouldn't want to believe Isaiah when Isaiah prophesied that in Isaiah 52? Who wouldn't want to believe that? Apparently, a lot of people did not believe that because Paul goes a few verses later to Isaiah 53.1. That's the next quote from Isaiah. Isaiah 53.1 says, Who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? What Isaiah is saying is, he's saying, I just announced that God is going to come back to his people, that he's going to redeem them from Babylon. But then in Isaiah 53, Isaiah says, but who's actually believed this? Apparently, a lot of people heard Isaiah and said, yeah, I don't think so. I don't think it's going to work out that way. Isaiah, go back home, have a nap, relax, take it easy. We don't believe you. Who has believed this, Isaiah said? Apparently, a lot of people didn't. The people did not believe that was a problem for Isaiah. It's a problem for Paul. God delivered great news through Isaiah. The captivity is going to end. A lot of people didn't believe it. The Apostle Paul delivers great news that there is a Messiah, Jesus Christ, who came, lived, died, rose again, will return. And a lot of people said, Paul, that's that's just not true. We don't believe you. And they weren't nice about it either. They tried to kill him. They harassed him. They slandered him. They lied about him. They persecuted him. And so as we think about that, let's apply that this morning. The good news, the announcement of beautiful, timely news is that God has already sent His Son to accomplish your salvation. Your salvation is not your job. That might be the most direct way to say it. God's done it for you. Your job is to hear it and believe it. The good news is that God has dealt with your guilt for sin, the things that you've done that you do not want to talk about. He's dealt with that at the cross. Christ paid the penalty for all for the the guilt that you have before God the Father for your sin. The good news for us to believe and not walk away from is that God has given you more grace, more mercy than you ever need. He's already given it to you. You don't have to be good this week, and then maybe He'll give it to you. It's not how that works. You don't earn grace by definition. He's given you more mercy, more grace through the work of Jesus Christ, applied to you by the Holy Spirit than you could ever ask for. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? The question is, do you wholeheartedly, deeply believe the good news of what Christ has done for you, that it is enough, or are you trying to contribute to it or add to it through sin avoidance, good intentions, good works, those kind of things? Those good works, those good intentions should just be a response to knowing that you're already redeemed. Ephesians 1, you've already received that down payment of a future inheritance, the Holy Spirit. And so this morning, to apply it, do you place your absolute trust in Christ and what He's done for you? Do you find your identity in who God is and what He has done for you? Or do you find your identity in who you are and what you can do for God? Those are two radically separate ways to live. Finding identity in Christ and what He's done rather than who you are and what you can do for God. The former is a good option. The latter is a bad option. The problem for Isaiah was unbelief. The problem for the Apostle Paul was unbelief. Don't let that be a problem for you. 
Hear the word of God, believe it, apply it, let it take root in your life. Uh, A few months ago, this past spring, there was a man named Clarence. Clarence from Idaho. And Clarence from Idaho took a trip. I think he was with his girlfriend. He's a grown man. He took his girlfriend. I think they went from Idaho and they went into um, Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. And they were doing what we did a few weeks ago. They were seeing all kinds of wildlife and seeing amazing things and all that. But, but Clarence, again, grown man, wanted more interaction with the wildlife. He wanted more interaction with these animals in Yellowstone. And so he, got, he approached, got closer um, to a bison. And not really sure from the story how this happened, what, what, what happened, but Clarence got close to a full-grown bison, which I think probably weighs as much as like a Honda Civic, probably. It's a, it's a huge beast. And something happened between Clarence and the bison, and Clarence ended up kicking the bison in the leg. This is a true story. This was the spring this year. The bison responded by just going right over Clarence and and roughing him up, uh, to use a a term we used earlier, and just ramming right into Clarence, knocking him out. And so some park people people there at the park called the park rangers, hey, we got an emergency, we got a man, Clarence is down. Clarence is down. We need help for Clarence. And so the park rangers rushed over to Clarence. They got him. They transported him to a hospital uh, for his injuries. I'm happy to report this morning that Clarence survived. Clarence made it. Uh, when, he, when he came to in the hospital, uh, he was charged by local law enforcement with, with three crimes. You'll guess the third one, I think. The first one is disorderly conduct. The second one is disturbing wildlife. And the third one, you probably guess it is public intoxication. So in other words, Clarence got a little drunk and took on a bison in front of his girlfriend. And he's lucky to be alive. When you're, when you're in Yellowstone, like, like most parks like that, there's signs everywhere. Stay a, stay a distance away from the wildlife. Don't approach wildlife. I think at one point we saw that large elk on the side of the road. And there was a ranger there watching to make sure People did not get close, too close to this elk. There are signs everywhere throughout Yellowstone to stay away from wildlife, do not approach. I don't think there's any signs not to kick because it's implied that you will not kick a bison because you're not going to be close enough to kick a bison. Clarence saw these signs everywhere and decided, I'm going to kick a 2,000-pound bison and see how that goes. He rejected the signs everywhere and did something incredibly stupid. Signs everywhere who wouldn't listen. That's, that's kind of the, the mindset as we look at Paul's quote from Psalm chapter, Psalm chapter 19, verse 4, which is, there are signs of God's word everywhere in creation, and people continue to reject it. Signs of stay away from the wildlife everywhere, and Clarence decided to reject it. Look at, look at the Apostle Paul's reference of Psalm 19. He says, there, God's voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. You might remember a few verses earlier in Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims His handiwork. The Apostle Paul is saying there are signs everywhere of God's Word in creation. There are signs everywhere that there is a Creator, that there is a God, that you're not here by accident, that you are created in God's image, that the creation is here intentionally by a a design from a Creator. There are signs everywhere. You should see them and and believe those signs. His voice is easy to hear. That's what Psalm 19 is saying. It goes to the ends of the earth. The heavens, everything declares God's glory. And so there's no excuse. You can see it everywhere. You can hear it everywhere. God's word is not hidden. It's not secret. That's what Paul is saying to the Jewish leaders who are rejecting Christ, is that God's word is everywhere. You can see it. You can see it throughout creation. Why are you rejecting it? The lack of faith from those uh, Jewish men and women who rejected Christ is not because they haven't heard. It's not because there's not enough evidence in creation to point them to God. It's because they've been around it, they've seen it, and they've rejected it. Like Clarence in Yellowstone, he's seen the signs and decided, I think I'll kick the bison. To, to kind of combine that illustration with the point here, to know God's Word and, and to hear it Sunday morning, to, to see God's revelation throughout the world and reject it, 
is incredibly stupid in the sense of it'd be smarter to just kick a bison than to see God's word, to know God's word and reject it. Because it's everywhere. There's no excuse. The word of Christ is being preached to you now this morning. Hear it, believe it, listen to it, reflect on it, believe it, and live by it. That's his point. You hear it, you see it in creation, believe it. In the final verses here, the Apostle Paul says, it's possible, and this is, this is a warning for us, it's possible to hear God's word and then walk away from it. He quotes, first of all, Deuteronomy 32. Remember, that's Moses. As Moses prepares to, to die, and he's given that final sermon, that final message to the people of Israel before they go into the land that God had promised Abraham centuries earlier. Deuteronomy 32, Paul quotes it. Um, he says in verse 19, Paul says, Since you rejected God's word, I'm going to give the gospel to people you look down on, the Gentiles. It's a reference back to Deuteronomy 32. The people you think are ignorant and foolish, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, those are the people that are going to hear it, receive it, and accept it. So that's a reference to Deuteronomy 32. And then in verse 20, the Apostle Paul quotes Isaiah 65. He says, since you didn't look for, my God, for, for, for God's word, I'm going to give my word to those people who weren't even interested, the Gentiles. They weren't even looking. I'm going to give it to them. And they're going to believe it. So note, note the irony here. Paul is, is using Isaiah 65, Deuteronomy 32. And he's saying, God's word will be received by those who previously didn't really receive it. The people who weren't looking for it, the people who weren't considered smart by the Jews are the ones who are going to be wise enough to receive it. There's an irony there. One scholar made this comment. He said, God tells Israel they are pursuing worthless idols, and because of that, God is going to give his gospel to the Gentiles, the very people the Jews considered worthless. Worthless idols, worthless people. Paul is saying, if you don't want it, you're not going to get it. If you're, you're too wise for it, I'm going to give it to the foolish. If you won't search for it, I'm going to give it to those that are lost, the Gentiles, and they're going to receive it. And his point here is very simple. It is, don't take God's word lightly. Don't hear it and then walk away from it. Hear it and believe it. And he quotes at the end of our text this morning, verse 21, the final quote from Isaiah 65, verse 2. He says, God is ready to receive you. He says from Isaiah 65, verse 2, All day long I have held out my hands. God is waiting to receive those penitent sinners who want to come back. For me, I read that and I thought of the story from Luke chapter 15. You remember Luke 15? I think we covered that a few years ago. The story of the prodigal son. The father is waiting all day for the son to return. That's the image of God. He's waiting all day with his arms open, waiting for them to return. And he promises he'll forgive them. They just have to hear it, believe it, and come back to him. I think this morning, if I, if I asked, with, with a few exceptions, maybe with some of the kids, maybe, if I asked, how many of you know the name Billy Graham? Everyone knows that name, right? Pretty much everybody, unless you're under a certain age, maybe. But I think if I asked, how many of you have heard the name Harold J. Ockengay? I wonder how many of you know that name. I'd be curious. How many of you know the name Harold J. Ockengay? Harold J. Ockengay was, he's, he passed away in 1985. Harold J. Ockengay, a um, very influential man in the middle of the 20th century for Protestants, for Christians. Um, he was influential in starting the National Association of Evangelicals. He was influential in starting um, the, the magazine Christianity Today. Uh, he, was, he started Fuller Seminary, which is in California. It used to be, I don't know if it still is, the largest seminary in the country. Uh, later on, he was president of Gordon Conwell Seminary, where I went, up in Massachusetts. Um, in the midst of that, he was also the pastor of Park Street Church in Boston, large uh, historical old church. The guy liked to work a lot. Um, he was also the, the mentor to Billy Graham. That's why I mentioned him. Billy Graham never made a ministry decision without talking to Harold J. Ockengay. Ockengay was a little bit older than, uh, than Billy Graham, and so if, if Graham had a decision to make, like, for example, Billy Graham was going to, he was thinking about starting a university, and he called Harold J. Ockengay, and they talked about it. Ultimately, they did not start that university. Every decision that Billy Graham made went through Harold J. Ockengay. Well, in 1985, Harold J. Ockengay was dying of cancer. He was on his literal deathbed, and he weighed under 100 pounds. They didn't know if he had hours left or just a few days. 
and he was dying in the small town of Hamilton, Massachusetts. And so the elders of his former church, Park Street Church, came to him to pray with him and, and to meet with him because they thought this might be it for him. And as the story is told, he, you know, he's lying there, he's motionless, he's not really interacting, he's, he's weak, he's literally under 90 pounds. He's, he's going to die very soon of cancer. One elder said to him to try to cheer him up, he said, quote, Just think of all the things that God has done through you. He's allowed you to minister to millions of people. You were the president of Fuller Seminary, the president of Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. You were the founder of the National Association of Evangelicals. You were one of the people who helped give Billy Graham a start in ministry. It's reported uh, by the former pastor of of Park Street Church, uh, Gordon Hugenberger, that when the elder said that, Akinge just lay there motionless. Nothing happened. He just laid there. Nothing stirred in him when he was given all those accomplishments of his life. And so as the elders looked over him, this frail minister dying, another elder said this to him. He said, Harold, I suggest that when you see the Lord, say to him, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And as Pastor Hugenberger reports or writes about this, he says, when Akinge, the dying minister, heard this, tears began to flow down his face as the deep comfort of God's promise began to work in his heart. Here's the point. As he lay dying there, when someone listed all of his accomplishments, it did not matter. But when someone mentioned the work of Christ, God's mercy to him, that he would forgive him, that God has his arms open wide for him, like which is the end of Romans chapter 10, that is what moved Harold J. Akinge in the final moments of his life. Not what he had done, but what God had done for him. In your life, if, if we're just very honest this morning, at the end of your life, your accomplishments will not matter to you. God's accomplishment for you will matter. And that is Christ died for you. He rose again. He's given you his Holy Spirit. That is what will matter to you when your life is about to end. It's what, not what you've done, but what he's already done for you. And knowing that, as, as Paul says here in Romans 10, verse 21, he has his arms ready to receive you. Akinge, when he lay there, was ready to, to know, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He knew he was going to be received. He had no doubts about that in my mind. And that, that's true for you. If you're trusting in Christ, you know what he's done for you. You know about Christ's death for you on the cross, and you believe it. You have full confidence that God's accomplishment for you is infinitely more important than any accomplishment you have in your own life. And it's all because of the cross. And that the sacrament this morning takes us to the death of Christ, that he died for your sins. He gave up his life so that you might have eternal life. That is good news for us this morning. And so think about that. Reflect on that truth this morning as we come to the Lord's table. Let's pray.